Good morning, some of you. How are you guys doing this morning? It is good to see you guys, and it's good to uh, be with you guys this morning, and welcome all those of you who are joining us online, whether you're at your home, somewhere else. Thank you for joining us this morning and inviting us to wherever you are. Today, we are in week four of our sermon series titled Ecclesia, where we've been looking at for the last four weeks, what is the church? Uh, that's what we looked at the very first week. We ex- examined the scriptures and looked to see what are the different images that the scriptures give us of what makes the church up. And we saw that the church is the body of Christ, that God calls his people out of darkness into light, into right relationship and fellowship with him. And he calls them and brings them from all different places and all different backgrounds and all different experiences to be one with him. And then one with one another, because we're all called into God's family, as we saw. And we're a part of the body of Christ that each of us has been uniquely gifted in different ways and placed into the church for a specific reason to help do what Jesus has set us out to do on the mission, as we've been talking about this morning so far, that as Jesus' disciples were given the commission to go therefore and make disciples, you and I have also received that same commission. You and I, who have given our life to Jesus, those who follow after Jesus have been called to be disciple makers and doing that in the context of the church. And that's what we looked at week number two. That's the mission of the church. We have a vision and a mission, and those are things that we believe Jesus himself would have given us. That we don't just exist for ourselves on a Sunday morning to occupy your calendar before the Super Bowl, although... Um, that may be what we're doing for some of you this morning. I'm a little sad I don't see any like Bengals gear out. Um, I'd expect, yeah, thank you. I'm, I, as a Cincinnati fan, I've been prone and programmed to have a broken heart. Um, so I'm expecting things not to end well for me today. But who knows? Maybe, we'll, 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 maybe next week uh, I'll be still running around excited with the Super Bowl victory. And maybe, maybe just maybe, um, my heart won't be broken yet again. But so if they lose, you know how to pray for me this week. If they win, you know how to pray for me because I probably will need to be humbled because I will be bragging about it for weeks on end. Uh, but we, we, we see that the church was given a vision and a mission to go make disciples and be an outpost uh, of God's kingdom that's coming and that we're to invite others into right relationship with God. And then last week we saw in week three, what are the healthy markers that define a church? If, if we're gonna be a part of a church and included within a church, there's certain things that we see that health is supposed to look like. And so that's opening up of the scriptures and teaching it within a certain way and that the church would be committed to prayer and the church would have uh, this qualified leadership that's going to be leading the church and that there's this engagement with one another that's expressed together when we gather. And if you remember last week, or if you weren't here last week, the eighth thing that Pastor Michael mentioned of one of the healthy markers of a church is a healthy understanding of belonging. So that's what we're actually going to look at this morning of what does it mean to belong? Because the first three weeks, we really looked at the church from uh, almost like a systematic theology way of what makes a church, how does a church function, all those things. But today we're really going to flesh it out a little bit more of what does it mean for you? If, if you're going to call yourself a, a, a person who calls some of you home and is a regular attender, somebody who's on mission with us, what does a healthy sense of belonging look like for you and I? That's what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, one of the things that you may have noticed that over the handful of weeks since we started this series, we've been talking about this theme for the year of know and be known. We've been talking that we are inviting you to step in with us for the next eight or nine months until the fall to partner with us to commit to four areas of discipleship that we believe that would be healthy, not only just for an individual to participate in, but if a church were to do it, we think that there would be stability and health and growth and all the good things that God would want for his church. That's what we've invited you into for the next few months. Uh, And so far, we've had over 100 people from our Heritage Park campus saying, hey, I want to be a part of this. I want to join in. So if that's you, thank you. Uh, as we've been getting your responses and your commitments to this, it's been really encouraging to our staff and to our leaders seeing people who have uh, been jumping in for the very first time. And so that's been really cool. But then the other thing that's been really encouraging is people who've called some of you home for a long time saying that they're just as excited to jump in with us for what this next year is going to be. And so if you're new here, I just want to invite you into it as well. For the next few months, we want to invite you to partner with us in four specific areas of what it looks like to grow within our spiritual uh, health, to know God better, and to be known by one another more. And so the first area is simply uh, helping and committing yourself to a daily devotional time. 15 minutes or so spending time with God daily, whether it's in the morning, in the evening, over lunchtime, that you will be committing yourself to just every day, sometime, you and God 
Uh, one of the things that's helpful is, as Sarah mentioned earlier, our, our Galatians Discipleship Guide. There's six days worth of daily devotional content already pre-written for you to help you further study the passage of Galatians that we'll be walking through that week. So if you're wondering, I don't even know how to have a daily devotional, we've got a good tool for you right here to help you kind of step into that. So that's the first area. The second area is committing to some type of community, joining a life group, participating in a body of believers to further study the scriptures together, to further get to know one another and grow in your relationships with one another. So that's the second area. Third area is an act of service. There's different opportunities for you to do that here at the church. Uh, even just this morning, it's been fun seeing new people jump onto the hospitality team. People who've never served before, jumping into greeters, jumping into serving with kids, jumping into our tech team. And so that's one of the other three areas. And then lastly, the fourth area is committed regular Sunday attendance. Because as we've been studying over the last few weeks, we see that the church isn't just a structure or a building or a place that is a physical location on a Sunday morning, but it's when the people of God come and meet together. And so we, we really can't have church fully without you because you are part of the church. And so that's why we are encouraging and inviting people to commit to these four areas with us the next nine, few months to know God further and to be known by one another more. So if you're interested in joining us in that, all you simply do is text us that number uh, that Sarah couldn't get right earlier, uh, <laughs> uh, 360-260-8300. Uh, and text the word no. Uh, that'll start a conversation uh, with us and one of our staff members, our leaders, our pastors will be reaching out to you and just helping you and maybe one of those areas that you feel like you might need some help in and partnering with you for the next few months of what it looks like to stay committed in those areas. Uh, so that's, that's what the no and be no theme is. If you're in here and you're wondering, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of those things already. Do I have to do that? I would just invite you and encourage you to take that step forward and say yes. Um, and if you're looking for a group, we have different groups that meet throughout the weeks and, and throughout the city. Uh, but one simple way for you to jump in, if, if, if that sounds like a large commitment, we have something starting next week called the Galatians Group Experience, which meets here at the church immediately after this service and it'll be in this room. And we'll have different tables set up for you to sit at and that will almost be like a taste test or an appetizer of what joining a group could look like. Uh, there'll be a leader at the table who will help facilitate the discussion and the study time. So what you would experience at somebody's house at a life group, you would just get to experience here kind of in a safe third space since you're familiar with the space. Because I know sometimes going to a stranger's house for the first time is uncomfortable. So if you're interested in joining a group and want a safe way to join a group, this might be a great way for you to do it. All you simply need to do is go to our website and register there. Save yourself a seat. We would love to have you next week. So we are talking about belonging. To be a part of something. To be a member of something. And the reason why the, the fourth week of our series is talking about this subject is because there's something that's pretty prevalent that is out there in our mindset and even within our culture today. And we've probably, to some uh, way, have said this ourselves. We would say, I want the kingdom that Jesus promises. I want, I want the things that he says he's going to do. I want to experience that. I want to be a recipient of his grace. I want the things that Jesus is about. I want the kingdom, but I don't want the church. And so there's something within us that we've almost separated the two, thinking that we can experience and receive and do the things that Jesus has for us, but then not necessarily give of ourselves and belong and be a part of the church. Uh, and then there's this, there's this priest that wrote a book a handful of years ago titled The Holy Longing. And a part of his book, he talks about the reason that many of us struggle within our spirituality is because we divorce those two. We divorce our spirituality from an understanding of the church and our involvement within the church. And in this book, he talks a few different reasons as to why we should go to church and desire to belong and be a part of the church because there's a God-given intended design for us to experience a sense of belonging when we meet with one another and we are a part of the church. He, he gives a couple of reasons, and I think some of them are, are really good, just a, a reminder or an encouragement for you this morning as we're here. Um, one of the reasons he says is because it's not good for us to be alone. We even see at the very beginning of creation when God creates Adam before he creates Eve, he makes the statement that it's not good for man to be alone. And he's not even just necessarily speaking to a marital relationship of husband and wife. He's just talking about relationally, dynamically. It's not good for us to be by ourselves. So one of the biggest ways to defeat loneliness and to defeat isolation is to actually involve yourself in the local gathering and body of the church. It's good to go to church because we are able to take our rightful place humbly within the family of humanity. We are, it's good to go because God has called us here. 
It's good to go because it dispels our fantasies about ourselves. We go because tens of thousands of saints have gone before us and told us it's a good thing for us to do. We go to help others carry their burdens and have others help them carry mine. We go to church to dream with one another, to practice for heaven, and simply because of the pure joy of it. So those are just some of the reasons why we would go to church. And all those things speak to that sense of belonging, a place to be a member of, a place where we feel like we fit, to be in the right place at the right time. And it's, uh, psychology has been talking about this over the last full handful of years as well. As many of us are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that little pyramid that talks about the things, different things that motivate us to do the different things that we want to do. So at the bottom level of that triangle, that pyramid, it just talks about just the physical, logical needs that we need to survive and what motivates us, food, air, water, shelter, those things. The next level up talks about safety. We, we want to feel safe. We gain employment, find resources, live a healthy lifestyle. And then the third tier is simply titled love and belonging. That's something that motivates almost all of us. Something that drives us and pushes us to engage ourselves in different activities with different groups and different people because there's a sense where we need to feel like we are loved and a place where we belong. All of us desire and need those things And God has actually intended and designed the church to help meet those needs. A place where friendship can be experienced, intimacy, family, a sense of connection. In a world where so many things feel manufactured with ease of connections, many of us have been left felt wanting. You see, all of us have this desire within us to have us feel felt. You know, it's one thing to say like, hey, I feel seen. Like I acknowledge that person's presence. Or hey, that person helped me, made me feel heard like they at least heard my voice. But there's a whole other deeper sense of saying, I have felt felt. That they've seen me, they've accepted me, they've welcomed me, that I am belong to them and they belong to me, that there's this deeper connection there. And it's crucial for us to experience. It drives many of us. And plenty of scientific research has come out in the last few years that tells us that the healthiest, most satisfied individuals are those who have a place to belong. That our deepest satisfaction comes not from achieving personal autonomy, but through acceptance and unconditional love and an unbreakable belonging to a people. And again, that's the place that God intends the church to be for us. Because the deepest longing of our human soul is to be loved and to be able to love in return. And I'm not just talking about love because tomorrow's Valentine's Day. Hint, fellas, just in case you forgot. (laughs) But uh, it's because it's important. The deepest fear for many of us is the possibility of being disconnected or lonely. Because again, all this is rooted in the fact that you and I were created in the image of God who is a relational God. So that means we have been wired spiritually, physically, neurologically, biologically for connections. Many of us are, of ourselves have involved ourselves into different groups, into different clubs, or even pay membership to different things to feel like we are a part of something. There's different gyms or school associations, different subscription services that will say like, hey, you, you belong to one of us, you are one of us. However, they really don't care about if your presence is there or not as long as they continue to draw from your bank account the subscription service, Right? Like the gym says, hey, you're one of us, but if we don't see you, that's okay because we're still getting money out of you. However, the church is not to be like that. The the, the church longs for your presence, for you to be physically present with me and me with you. Because if we believe that the church isn't just a building or a structure, but a collection of God's people, call out to be on missions, to be disciples advancing his kingdom, the thing that we need from one another is our presence a place where we can belong and help others belong as well. And where we're going with this this morning is because the idea of belonging and love are interconnected and things that you and I need. And you and I both know if you've ever been in love, love changes you a little bit, right? I remember before my wife and I got married, uh, she has had a great influence on me in a lot of different ways, and I on her. For example... A handful of years ago, I thought there was nothing wrong with gas station burritos and corn dogs. 
I, that was my food pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> she was ashamed to know me. What, what'd you have for lunch? I ain't telling her. <laughs> but over time, because of different choices we have made together and things that we've experienced together, my desires have changed in life to where even yesterday she and I were driving together and I said, you know what I'm really craving? And she's like, what? I'm like, I just want an apple. She's like, what happened to my husband? <laughs> And even as I was having this conversation with her preparing for this week, I asked her, I'm like, hey, what do you think of, what have you noticed that's changed in your life? And she's like, my appetite. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I never wanted chicken wings before I met you. I'm like, you're welcome. You're, you're, you're welcome. Um, but yes, we, we've had influences on one another. Uh, you know, our palates. Um, I've been able to help her purge uh, the sin of loving country music. Uh, she's, um, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a remnant that hangs in there, but we're working on it. Uh, But we've partnered together to look forward to a future and our love for one another has impacted the way that we view things. And those are silly examples, but you all know if you've been in a relationship or been in community in connection with one another, your affinity and affection for somebody changes the way that you view things and experience things. Like some of you people today will watch a Super Bowl that you could care less about, but the person you love loves the Super Bowl, so you'll do it for them. Love has an impact on us. So there's nothing more important for many of us is love. And Jesus actually speaks to this quite a bit to, in his earthly ministry that should have an impact of how we view when we gather together. And so the very first time we him, see him kind of beginning to tease this out is this interaction that he has with some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and these different individuals within his day. And at that time, oftentimes, these different leaders and teachers would debate openly and have these conversations of all the different commandments, all the different things that we see within the Old Testament. They would want to debate, hey, which one is the most important? Which is the one that we need to pay attention to the most? Like, is this one on the same level as that one? Which one's more weighty? Which one does God really care about more? And they come to Jesus and ask him this question in Matthew 22, and they say this, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend on the law and the prophets. So Jesus immediately responds to their question. And he says, not only just gives them one, but gives them two commandments. He says, love the Lord your God with all your mind, your heart, and your soul. So he's not necessarily talking about the different compartments, like make sure, hey, on Tuesday you do leg day for Jesus, and on Wednesday you do like a mental exercise for Jesus, those types of things. He's saying all of your being, your entire essence, your entire person belongs to God, and you love him with all of your being. That, that's the very first thing that we have to get priority first, that you understand the love God has for you, that he displays for you in Christ, and that you would in return love him with all of your being. And then Jesus adds onto it saying that you would love your neighbor as yourself. Because Jesus knows those who have a wholehearted love for God means that they will come to see and measure others as God sees them as objects of his love as well. So Jesus wouldn't then necessarily have us ask the question of who is our neighbor, but we begin asking the question of ourselves, well, who is my neighbor that I can begin to love? Who is God bringing into my world that I could show them the same love that God has showed me? And Jesus, in this, begins to speak to the power of giving ourselves to something and increasing our investment to things means our care and attention to it increases. You know, there's always that individual in our lives that, you know, never before paid attention to the stock market or paid attention to cryptocurrencies, but then now that they've invested a little bit, that's all they want to talk about. Because where they have invested of something of importance to them, their attention begins to go towards it. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because even Jesus teaches on that. Jesus even tells us that where your treasure is, your heart will also be. So Jesus is instructing us and giving us this mindset that we need to think about investing and giving of ourselves to something in order that our actions and our behaviors and our love and affections would follow. So we don't just sit and wait for the church to love me so I can love it in return, or I don't wait for this individual or my neighbor to love me so I can love them in return, but he's calling us for this intentional act of that we would actually give of ourselves where we invest ourselves our sense of belonging is found there. So it's an intentional act on our part to engage of ourselves, to give of ourselves, to commit ourselves to things. Because if you are here this morning and you're looking for a place to belong, you must give of yourself intentionally, knowing that your heart will follow it. 
we must give of our love. And in that act, we begin to find a place where we belong and others can belong as well. But then even as we think about that, we, we might have uh, that foreigner song running through our head, right? I want to know what love is. You want me to show you? Glad you said that. I will, gladly. Paul picks up on this in his letters in the book of Romans. In the first 11 chapters, he spends all this time talking about uh, the glories of God, who God is, what he's done, who Christ is, what Christ has done, how the spirit comes and makes us alive and how the spirit helps us wrestle with our flesh and all these other things. So great doctrine in the first 11 chapters. And then once you get to chapter 12 and through the rest of the book, he talks about building a Christian ethic of how we are to relate and connect with one another and operate within the world. And he begins to speak to picking up what Jesus talks about love in a few different ways. And I want to show you this morning. The first part is in Romans 13, starting in verse 8. He says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So Paul, all throughout the book of Romans, talks about how certain debts have been paid on our behalf. And obviously the biggest one that we talk about regularly here at church is the sin debt that Christ has paid for us on our behalf to God. That our our sin has left us fallen short of the glory of God and that our sin has separated us from him. And so there is a debt that needs to be paid to begin to be put in right relationship with God. That there's nothing that you and I can do that can pay for that debt. You know, that's why we sing that song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. That's what we're talking about when it comes to a sin debt, that there's nothing that we could do to make us in a right relationship with God. And that's what the first part of Romans spends a lot of time talking about. But Paul says something really interesting here at the beginning of 13, where he says, love is an unpaid debt. So we, we, we've already been made right with God. We've already been made in right relationship. However, he's saying we're to owe no one anything. So we, we, pay, we take care of our things except to love one another. So Paul is instructing us that whatever debts we incur, we make sure we pay them. However, there is one debt that remains outstanding because we can never pay it. And that's the duty of love towards one another. We can never stop loving We can never get to the point where we could say, I have loved you enough. There will always be a new way for us to fulfill that obligation for one another, to create a place of belonging for one another. You see, this is what Jesus is alluding to in in some of his teaching in the upper room discourses. The final night before he goes to the cross, he has these different interactions with his disciples, and he says at one point this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you you're also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so what we're seeing here as we begin to think about this is that the loving one another describes a responsibility, an obligation, as well as a privilege we have towards one another and the way that we ought to live together. One another's are a very important part of the early Christian church. As you see, if you explore the New Testament, uh, that term is listed over 100 times in over 94 different verses. So if we were to spend a time of season looking at the church like we have, we can't overlook the part where Jesus actually instructs how his church is to behave and interact with one another and creating that sense of belonging with one another. It's by looking at some of those one another's. We're told that we are members of one another. We're invited to be devoted to one another. In the same way that a brother is devoted to another brother or husband to a wife, we are to devote ourselves to one another. We honor one another above ourselves. We're to live in harmony with one another. We are to accept one another. We are to instruct one another and greet one another. Uh, It even says greet one another with a holy kiss. Maybe that cultural context is messing on us. We should bring that back at some point. What do you think, Bruce? (laughs) We'll talk talk later. Okay. (laughs) But we are to greet one another. We're to serve humbly in love. We carry one another's burdens. We are to encourage one another and build one another up. We are to live at peace with one another. We're to do good to one another. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. We're to be kind and compassionate to one another. 
to submit to one another, to forgive one another. We're to spurn another one on to love and good works. We're to confess our sins to one another. We're to pray for one another, to love one another deeply from the heart, offer hospitality, clothe ourselves with humility. The list can go on. So you see, to create a place of belonging, a place where you feel like you fit and a place where others fit, the, the, it, it really hinges upon you stepping in and engaging. You saying, I'm, I hear Jesus' instructions and I hear the apostles' instructions to, of what, building this community. And I'm, I'm going to pursue that, not necessarily sit back and wait for somebody to do that for me and trusting that somebody will because we're all gonna seek to strive to seek to show Christ towards one another. So when we come in on a Sunday, our, our, our focus isn't necessarily about me. What am I gonna get? Like, I'm not gonna be upset when Becky's in my seat for the third week in a row. Doesn't she know that's my seat? I'm gonna be like, man, maybe Becky needs to see there because I, she might have hard eyesight and she gets to see the screen or maybe she likes sitting there because it's closer to this or that. Or maybe, you know, I'm gonna go sit next to Becky anyway. There's a certain level where we need to begin to take the blinders off of ourselves and when we come into church on Sunday morning, we're not just here for ourselves, but we're actually seeking out for the, another individual that I can serve, that I can pray for, a person that I can encourage, a person that I can build up rather than just beelining it for the coffee and the donut holes and beelining for my seat. I begin to think about the others that are in the room with me. And when I see somebody on this side of the room, I can look on the other side of the room. There's somebody over there that I can express one of the one another's to, that I could humbly serve, that I could pray for, that I could encourage, that I could build up. Or maybe there's somebody on that side of the room that I'm frustrated with, or maybe I've said something that I shouldn't, and I need to go confess my sin to that one person. Because one of the best ways for you to feel like you belong is to begin to step in and press into the things that God has laid out for his body of believers to do. And what Paul said in that passage in Romans 13, it says that when we love one another, when we do those things, we fulfill the law. We're not doing harm to one another. So if we truly love our neighbor, we will seek their good and not harm them. And the important thing in that is it's just, okay, maybe I'm not actively harming them, but you not actively stepping into the things that the scriptures have for you actually is harming them. Yeah, you may not be attacking them or verbally assaulting them or doing something else like that we would say is harming, but you withdrawing and not actively engaging actually is a level of harm. Matthew Henry, a commentator on this passage says, uh, more is implied than is expressed. It not only does no harm, but it also does all the good things that may be. This kind of love fulfills the law, is active and not just reactive. It looks for ways to do good to people before they have need. So if you're looking for a place to belong, it's not just sitting and waiting to receive it, it's you actually stepping in and actively giving of it. And the reason why that is, is because that's the example that Christ has set forth for us. So Paul in the letter of Romans continues to explain to the believers of Rome what it looks, means to walk in love towards one another. In chapter 14 and 15, he speaks about a relationship between strong and weak brothers and sisters. He never tells us who they are or what they, teachings they held to, but he speaks to tendencies that we find within the church that we're not to see of ourselves too highly and we must not think vulnerable individuals who lack self-control and what might be a matter of conscience. Paul stresses the fact that we as believers are to live at peace with one another even when we disagree on matters that are not essential to salvation. We must realize that we will fall into one camp or the other. And it's up to us to build a culture and environment where we can walk out the one another's, a place to belong for one another, where this can be experienced. And so in this next section that I'm gonna show you, uh, Paul doesn't use the word love, but the conduct and attitude is best understood as an outflow of love. And he says this in Romans 15, starting in verse one. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and to not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. 
Paul says, we are to bear with the weakness of one another. Now, some of you might have varying definitions of what strong or weak or good or bad is, but what the instruction here that we see Paul say is, we're to bear with one another. Every culture, the strength seems to take little notice of the weak, and the strong tends to use their strength to ease their own burdens. And we often overlook the fact that the strength that most of us have was actually given to, in order for us to help those who are weak or to help others. What's interesting to me is what Paul says here about what, how we are to treat and respond to one another who we see as weaker. He says, bear with them. When you could also say we, to endure them to tolerate, to carry, or support. We are to use our, our, our strength to help compensate for one another's weakness. Notice how he doesn't say that we are to criticize or to condemn or to mock or attack or even ignore. Paul says that we are to use what we've been given to bear with one another in order that that sense of belonging could take place. He says that we would use our lives and we would seek to approach one another and live in such a way that we wouldn't seek to please ourselves. Because to belong and create an environment of belonging for one another, we cannot be self-centered or self-seeking. We can't trample upon one another. Selfishness is a barrier to effective Christian community. So Paul tells us to bear with one another. And that doesn't mean that we don't ever get anything that we do want or hope for. But what he is saying, that we are never to do what pleases us regardless of the effects that it has on others. That there's this supposed to be this humility that takes place within the body of Christ with the people of God, that they're actually looking out and seeking out to care for one another, even on matters that they disagree with on one another. If we can come to the table and agree of who Jesus is, the, the Nicene Creed that we read earlier together, it's intentional why we do these things, that we all confess those things. So we're all in agreement of that's what we believe in. However, we begin to let other smaller, insignificant, really silly things divide us and tear us down. So rather than being frustrated or angry or like giving dirty looks to one another, it says, hey, we're gonna bear with one another. I'm not gonna hit eject. I'm not gonna leave. I'm not gonna ditch out. I'm gonna bear because I know you have to bear with me as well. It's so returning the favor. So Paul says we, we, we seek to please our neighbor and build them up. Now, we don't want to confuse this with people pleasing, you know, trying to gain good status for our own benefit or for our own things. The scripture speaks to that elsewhere. But he's inviting us and asking us to act wisely towards one another and do what it takes to build one another up in faith instead of causing someone to stumble, instead of trying to seek to tear them down, or to cause them damage, or to edify, or to build up. And, and what's the whole motivation for this? Paul says it in the middle of that passage. We do this because of what Christ has done for us. When it talks about that the reproaches fell on him instead of us, all the things that we deserved because of our sin, because of our weakness, because of our flaws, Jesus gladly and willfully took them on for us to bring us into a right relationship with him and right relationship with God. He didn't, uh, he bared our burdens for us and he continues to do so today. So that's the motivation. And, and verse five and six of that passage are essentially a benediction, a simple prayer that Paul has for the church that I think is beautiful that we could be praying for our church as well that because of Christ that we can be united and belong with one another. Amen. It's a prayer that God, would you make your church one that is unified in gospel essentials and that we would show charity to everything and everyone else. So if we could come to the table in agreement of who Christ is and come to the agreement that you and I are sinners that were separated from God and that it was nothing of our performance or nothing of our religious attendance to these things that made us right with God, but, but free gift of God through Christ if I can be a recipient of that and you as well, who are we to then begin to build up dividing walls or barriers or allow wedges to be driven over things that are not as important as that? And then and Paul says something else here in this passage, which is important for us to mind is he wants these things that be, because if we don't allow those things to divide us or separate us or tear us down, we would be able to be with one voice, glorify God the Father. 
Do you see that? For us to have a place that we can belong, that means all of us would use our voices together to glorify God. But oftentimes we're not using our voice to glorify God, we're using our voice to tear down, distract, destroy, confuse, ridicule, shame. So if we're we're looking for a place that we can belong, a place where others can belong, how do we do that? Verse seven tells us, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Because when Christ accepts someone, who are we to say that we will not take him or her as a Christian brother or sister? If Christ has accepted them, even though I am different and may hold a different view, I have no right to not accept them into my fellowship and into worship with Christ. So if we're seeking a place to belong, if we're seeking for a place where we can call home, that we can commit ourselves to, that we can intentionally give ourselves to, it means that I'm going to approach it in a way to accept you and welcome you in and tell you you belong. So if you're here this morning, whether you've been calling some of you home for years, for weeks, decades, couple hours, I want you to know that you belong here, that you are accepted here and welcomed in because I have been a recipient of God's grace and I want you to experience the same. So I will welcome you in. You belong here. And I know for some of you, that's, it's a hard thing to hear and it's a hard thing to want to give ourselves to because we know that some of the biggest pain and hurt in our life has come from a church. And I understand that. And I know there's difficulty in this because if, if we're honest with ourselves, if we're looking for a reason to not commit, we're going to find one. And if you're looking for a reason to leave, you're going to find one as well. However, what Christ invites us to is the sense of belonging, of commitment to one another, to live out what God has called us and invited us to, and bear with one another, to serve one another, to love one another, to lay down our lives for one another. We read those passages and be like, man, I I love that idea. I want somebody to do that for me. Hopefully that is what your experience will be here. Because we would commit to one another to express those things together for one another. Carlo Credo was a, a, an Italian monk who spent time in ministry and then with time into the wilderness uh, and had a, a love-hate relationship with the church, uh, which I think many of us probably share in to some degree. He lived as a hermit and would often translate scripture into languages that individuals that didn't have the scriptures before, but then he'd go back in missions and ministry and would kind of go back and forth. And at one point when he withdrew and he was doing some time of reflecting, he wrote this letter uh, titled An Ode to the Church that I think speaks pretty accurately to what many of our feelings and thoughts are. And I hope it encourages you this morning. He says this, how much must I criticize you, my church? And yet how much I love you. How much you have made me suffer much and yet owe much to you. I should like to see you destroyed and yet I need your presence. You have given me much scandal, and yet you alone have made me understand holiness. Never in this world have I seen anything more obscure, more compromised, more false, and yet in this world have I touched anything more pure, more generous, and more beautiful. Many times I felt like slamming the door of my soul in your face, and yet how often I have prayed that I might die in your sure arms. No, I cannot be free of you, for I'm one with you, even though not completely you. Then too, where would I go? To build another church? But I cannot build another without the same defects, for they are my own defeats I bear with me. Again, if I build one, it will be my church and no longer Christ's. No, I'm old enough to know that I am no better than others. I shall not leave this church found it on so frail a rock because I should be found another on an even frailer rock 
myself? And then what do rocks matter? What matters is Christ's promise. What matters is the cement that binds the rocks into one, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit alone can build the church with the stones as ill-hewn as we. So this morning as we close, as we always do, we have an opportunity to respond to what we hear and reflect upon what is Christ inviting us to. And in in this time of communion, uh, we are reminded of the the cost that it takes to make us right in relationship with God and to bring us into communion with him and to communion with one another. And this morning as we take communion, I want us to think about the ways and maybe which we have abdicated the responsibility that we have to help create a place of belonging. Whether we've been actively seeking or maybe we've just been passively sitting by. Or maybe there's something else you need to confess this morning before you take communion. But as you do this, I want to have you do it in a way that reminds you that your sins are forgiven. That your sins are forgiven. So we could take it confessing our sins, knowing that he's faithful and just to forgive us as we confess them. And that as we sing songs later, that we could do it out of a heart of worship and thankfulness for what God has done in Christ for us. And there's something else that we're going to do and hopefully seek to get better at in the season that come as well is begin to live out those one and others that we see all throughout the scriptures. And one of those ways today is we're gonna have some people uh, up front ready to receive you and pray for you. So if there's something that you need prayer for, healing, maybe you need to confess something, maybe you're just confused and you need some guidance and direction, whatever you may need prayer for, we're gonna have different leaders and pastors and people up front ready to receive you, welcome you and pray for you. So if you wanna wait to take communion after you pray with somebody, that's fine too. Over the next two songs, we wanna create the space for you to connect with God, pray, worship, And so if those of you who are on the prayer team want to come down and and be ready to receive people, and over the next two songs, uh, feel free to take your communion, come get prayer, and stand and sing with us.